Satsriya Kal um, to everybody uh, who's here. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today about low vision services um, based on both my clinical practice and my research over the years. Um, so we have a definition in the U UK of what is severely sight impaired or what we consider blind and what is sight impaired or what we consider partially sighted for registration purposes. So this is a legal definition, which is based on a combination of visual acuity and visual field. So um, in brackets, the VA levels I've got there are logma, and then um, I've got the UK notation. Is that the same as what you use in India? Yes, we have adopted the global uh, definition uh, now. And earlier we were six by 60, but it is now whatever it, as what you have. Yeah. So, so these notations are familiar to everybody then. So yeah, so we, you, you have multiple levels. So if you have um, a full field, but poorer VA or better VA, but a more reduced field, um, then you're still entitled to be registered as, as severely sight impaired or sight impaired. And the different categories come with different levels of benefits. Um, so th that's the difference between those two. Um, so in terms of financial benefits or access to different services, um, not everyone has to be registered. The patients are given a choice whether they want to be registered, and some services are accessible even without being registered. So access to um, rehabilitation services, for example, so mobility training, home visits to help adapt the home, that kind of thing you can access without registration, um, but um, you need registration to get um, a reduction on paying TV license or getting um, benefits. So um, what do we do in the low vision consultation? Well, we actually do quite a lot um, during the low vision consultation. We're there to listen to the patients and answer their questions concerns because not everybody is going to have the same concerns we're there to signpost them to other services we're there to provide them with practical advice um, and give them hope that they can lead a fulfilling life with their visual impairment um, and that can often include training family members as well. We're there to optimize refraction. We're there to provide low vision aids as well um, where indicated. And I'm going to go through all those bits in detail at, and go beyond that as well during the, the next 40 minutes or so. So I've, I've taken this from Oxford, from the last hospital I worked in. Um, and this is our pro forma for the first low vision assessment that we do with them. And it's a double sided page. You'll see it's on yellow paper and that is on purpose. And it's so we can find it quickly in the notes and it's good contrast. Um, and contrast is something, again, I'm going to talk quite a lot about today. But black on yellow, black on white is really good contrast, but yellow stands out in the notes. And this is just a helpful prompt for us as clinicians in a busy clinic to actually remember all the bits, all the important bits that we need to actually go through during the consultation. So I'm going to go through this bit by bit and break it down for you. The most important part and what we probably spent 50% of the consultation on is history. So this involves the medical history, diagnosis, how long they've had their visual impairment, what do they know about their future, what are their fears around that, what do they feel about that, their general history, family history, um, because there is an interaction between general health 
and how they're going to cope. Um, but also, we might need to take into account difficulties with medication. So are there issues around seeing the medication bottles that we need to address? Do they currently drive? Um, are they legal to drive? Do we need to advise them on that? Do they have any other disabilities that we might need to take into consideration? Because if someone's got arthritis, for example, then they might not be able to hold certain magnifiers. So we might need to be able, have to think about solutions. Do they have hearing impairment as well? Um, as the population ages, the, the, there are more people with both vision and hearing disorders. So we need to take that into account um, with any recommendations that we make. Then we look at living arrangements. Um, who lives with them or are they alone? How much support do they have? Um, do the people who live with them, do they understand if they are living alone? Do they have other social support? Are their friends, family, neighbors? or carers coming in, do they understand the visual impairment? Because you get a lot of people come in and say, oh, people don't believe me. So if someone's got macular degeneration, they can see something out in the side. So if something's moved or they've caught something on the floor from the corner of their eye, they, they're like, oh, there's something on the floor, but they turn to look at it and suddenly it's disappeared into their blind field. But then the family members might think, oh, you, you saw that, so you can't possibly be blind because there's, there's just no understanding of what being blind really is. The World Health Organization defines it as having vision so low that it interferes with your day-to-day -day living. So that's the message we've got to get across. So sometimes when the worst part of, of the interaction for a, a patient is the fact that the people around them are being dismissive or not understanding, then the most helpful thing I can do actually might be just to get out my simulation specs. I've got a set of glasses in the clinic which simulate different types of visual impairment um, and I'll put those glasses on the relatives and go, okay, now try and function with that pinhole or with the center blocked out and tell me whether you can do it. Um, and that can be really eye-opening for the relatives and suddenly then they have this understanding of why some things can be seen but other things can't and why someone with retinitis pigmentosa, for example, might be able to read to the bottom of the chart but can do, can't really get around because the, the fields are so small. So, um, yeah, so it's worth spending that time in establishing what links they have. And some of our research shows that actually people who are better supported do better um, than someone who is socially isolated. And that might they and you can be socially isolated even when you've got people around you, but if they're dismissive, then you'll still be socially isolated. Then we go to practical things. So how are they managing with tasks that they need to do? Um, obviously this was designed with the UK in mind. So they might not need to do all of these things um, because I'm aware that lifestyles in India can be quite different, but, um, but you know, if, if someone is cooking for themselves, then how, talk me through, how do you manage to, to do that, um, what think parts of it do you have difficulty with? Can, the, can you see the food on your plate when you're eating? How are you coping when you go shopping? Um, can you see your money? Can you see the TV? How well do you cope with reading? What do you like to read? Um, and can you manage it? Um, um, and we go through what devices they use and um, can they see their phone, all this kind of thing. Then when getting out and about, uh, oh, PNC means post and correspondence, by the way. Um, mobility um, is both at home and outside in familiar places, unfamiliar places. What 
what aids do they use? Do they use a white stick? If not, why not? Um, because especially younger people tend to be very resistant to using a white stick. Have they had falls? Because we know that with a visual impairment, you're more likely to have falls. And then that can cause other complications such as hip problems or broken bones. So we want to try and prevent falling by addressing the visual needs. Um, do they use any sunglasses? Um, are there any glare problems? And then we ask about what they do for work, hobbies, social activities. What do they miss doing if they've given those things up? And what aids do they use at the moment? Um, because we try and get people back into the hobbies that they, they want to be able to do. Okay, so there are lots of different ways that we can actually measure vision. Um, obviously, it's best to um, use the Logmar chart. A Snellen chart is hopeless. Um, the Logmar chart, because of its even spacing between the letters on a line and between lines, um, and the, the equal steps that you get, it's so much better for low vision. And then you can move the distance and you can calculate the score because everything's graded. It's easy to calculate how things change as well. Um, so uh, so we, we stick to the logmar as much as possible. Um, and then the Pelly robson chart is, is good for screening for contrast sensitivity because the vast majority of people with a low vision are going to have reduced contrast sensitivity, which has a big impact on day-to-day -day living. And this uses um, a large letter, six over 200 letter, which then decreases in contrast and it's very easy to score, very easy to perform. Then you can also, um, when you can't read the letters on the standard logmar charts anymore, you can move to this um, set of tests. So they, this is the Berkeley rudimentary vision test. So this was the paper that Monica was referring to. Um, and it's a set of three cards. So it's not very expensive. And basically, you start off with the E shape and you ask, you, you orientate the E and ask them to say which way is it facing. Um, and if they can't see that, then we have gratings. And if they can't see that, then we have this coarse um, black white discrimination. Um, and there's a computerized version of this called the Fract, which is free to download and use as well. Um, and the reason for looking, so even if you're off the chart, I mean, court count fingers hand movements is not very accurate. It's not reliable. So actually being able to get a quantitative measure at those low vision levels is actually really useful because patients' quality of life is vastly different, even within that range. And they will still come to you and say, oh, things are getting worse. So we still need to be able to monitor that range and be able to try and help them. So if we can better quantify what's going on, which we can do using either these, these um, cards, the BRVT or the computerized version, the FRAG, then, then at least we can see how things are changing and then be able to give advice accordingly. And with newer treatments coming up, you know, there's more that we can do for patients. And then for reading, we tend to use these, um, this standard N chart, which gives us N notation. And these are paragraphs that don't necessarily make sense. So you can't necessarily guess what word is coming next which means that um, it's really reliable. Uh, it's more reliable because we know that patients are actually reading the words and not just comprehending and guessing what's coming next. And then as they get bigger, it just becomes random words. Um, and then there's also music there. But we also ask people to bring in samples of what they want to be able to see. Um, so we actually keep some newspapers in the clinic 
so that they we can try them on real life um, examples of print because the newspaper is very different from a chart. So we know the newspaper is roughly N8, but the contrast is so different from a chart that actually we want to, if they want to read the newspaper, we want to make sure that we can make them read the newspaper. So we ask them to bring in their favorite newspaper or magazine. We ask them to bring in their medicine bottles. If they're fond of knitting or sewing, we ask them to bring in samples. If they like to look at photographs, we ask them to bring in samples so that we can make sure that we're tackling their problems. We don't need to aim for N5 or the smallest print for everybody because not everybody wants that. We want to be able to tackle whatever they want to achieve to make their life more pleasurable. And that's the key take home message is that you don't do the same for everybody. You are literally just trying to achieve whatever they want to achieve in order to make life pleasurable again. So there are three core principles of low vision, lighting, magnification and contrast. So lighting, really easy, really cheap. Good lighting is the key. Um, and it's not just the type of lighting. So the actual type of bulb, the color, none of that matters so much. It's more the distance on the print. See, or, or whatever you're trying to see, your meal, whatever you're trying to see. So having good general lighting is important, but also having lots of table lamps so that you can get the lighting nice and close because you've got the inverse square law. So when you double the distance away from what you're trying to see, you quarter the impact of the light. So getting the light nice and close is really important. So having an angle poise lamp, so a lamp that you can move around and actually focus is what is going to be more important than anything else. And when people are out and about, I advise them to get these torches. So mag lights are my fa personal favorite, but any torch, even on the phone nowadays, you, you get fairly reasonable torches and um, that you can shine on things and that will help immensely. Then you've got contrast. So here's some yogurt, some day. You'll notice that the yogurt in the white bowl is not as easy to see as compared to the blue bowl. So the person who's eating it from the white bowl with poor contrast sensitivity won't be able to tell when it's finished. Whereas in the blue bowl, it's going to be a lot easier to be able to tell. So I, I always advise people to have two sets of, of cutlery and crockery. So when you're eating light colored food, serve it on a dark plate against a light background, a light mat, colored mat, because then you can see the plate against the light colored mat and you can see your light colored food against the dark plate. And then the same applies vice versa. So if you've got dark colored food, you want to have it on a white plate and have it against a dark background, dark mat. So the green leaf here is really visible, but the white yogurt is not. The red berry here is really visible against the white yogurt, which is really visible against the blue bowl. Really simple. But you can apply this to everything, um, to sorting out clothes, to um, if you're struggling with telling the, the edge of the steps at home, put a marker on the edge of the steps, some tape, um, and that will help you see the edge of them better so you're less likely to trip. Um, so like literally everything can be enhanced by contrast, by markers. Contrast is also um, really critical in mobility. So when you go outside, you can't see cracks in pavements. You can't see when the pavement, when, when the road and the pavement meet. So when you need to step up, step down, 
um, because it's all gray on gray, where the road is uneven. Um, and it's been a while since I've been to India, but I remember the roads there are, can be quite uneven, the pavements can be quite uneven. So that's a real trip hazard. Um, and this is why the white cane can actually be really, really good because the white cane, so it, it folds up and you can hide it away, but then when you need it, you pull it out and you, you have to learn how to use it. But it's basically um, used as a tactile marker. So by feeling your way, you can feel where the obstacles are and you can feel where the surface changes. So a lot of people say it gives them their independence map back. And this particular marker, uh, White Cane, has got the red on there. So that indicates that this person has also got a hearing problem as well. Um, but uh, a pure white cane is visually impaired only. Um, so, uh, and, and then if, you, if I see someone's got a white cane, I'm also more likely to go and offer them help. I never just grab them but I will ask them, would you like some help? Can I help you cross the road? So, so in an ideal society, it would make people more um, considerate of that individual as well. But more important than anything, it helps the individual feel um, for, for um, any obstacles in the way, any bumps on the road. So you so that they are much less likely to fall and trip over things and they can get around places glare is often a big problem and just sunglasses alone aren't always the solution because sometimes you don't want to reduce the amount of light that's going in the eye because that can reduce the amount of helpful vision that the individual is getting so we and also you want to reduce the amount of UV light going in the eye rather than just light. Um, so the way to do this is using proper glare control. Um, so we advise wraparound glasses because then you target the UV from all angles. Um, whereas sunglasses only really target the light coming straight ahead at you. Um, so where the, whereas these wraparounds, they have a shield on top, they have these side shields and they wrap all the way around um, from the, uh, below as well. So they prevent all like the, the light coming in from all angles, which will hugely reduce glare. But you'll see they've got these translucent windows in the side, so they let the useful light through and you can get different colors, different um, translucencies um, so that the individuals can choose what suits them best because different conditions will be more or less photosensitive and some conditions you want to maximize the amount of visible light going in other conditions you want to reduce the amount of visible light going in so you need to be able to manage that according to the individual and according to their condition it's important to optimize the refraction. A lot of patients will come in and go, oh, I don't wear my glasses anymore because they're not doing anything. My vision's too poor. But actually, you want to improve the clarity of what's there. So it's important to explain, yeah, we can't make it perfect, but any help we can give you will reduce the risk of you falling and will make things at least that bit brighter. Some of the reading, some of the magnifiers will need reading glasses, and I will explain to you when I come to talk about the calculations. I'll explain to you more about that. Um, a plus, you can issue for someone with mild low vision. You can issue a plus four reading ad, which gives you two times magnification, but then it has to be used quite close. So it has a working distance of 25 centimeters, which a lot of people find really difficult to sustain. So it's not often very well to tolerated. And in low vision, you have to be really careful about um, prescribing multifocal lenses. Um, because of all the aberrations, 
people just don't tolerate them very well. And you want to maximize the field of view that you're giving. So usually two separate pairs works well, but that's a conversation to have in detail. Okay, so different types of magnifiers that we've got. Um, this one is a chest magnifier. So it just rests on your chest, hangs in front of you, and it's good for knitting or sewing underneath. It's got a wide field of view, but very low magnification. So there's a, there's a real limit to how far you can go with this. It's about 1.8 times. Dome magnifiers are great for people with diabetic retinopathy because they concentrate the light in there. So they're not very high magnification, but they're really good at enhancing, con uh, enhancing contrast because they gather all the light from the surrounding and concentrate it on the page. So if you don't need high magnification levels, but the contrast sensitivity has been disproportionately affected, this kind of thing works really, really well. Then you've got these hand magnifiers, which can come with a light. So this button is to control the light, lighting in there. Um, and they come, uh, the lower magnification come in either circle or, or this rectangular shape and the higher magnifications are only circular. Um, and then the stand magnifiers sit on the page. So it fixes your working distance. So whereas with the hand magnifier, you have to like, figure out how far away you're holding it from what you're seeing. So it gives you more flexibility, but you have it's up to you to hold it at the right distance. Whereas the stand magnifier, it has that um, stand already attached. And again, it comes with a light inbuilt to it. So to calculate a rough starting point, you want the size of the print that they're able to read with just glasses divided by the size of the print that you're aiming for. And remember, you're not always aiming for far, uh, N5. It depends what they want to read. And that will be your starting magnification. And then you try that and then you can try other ones. And it is often a bit of trial and error to find the right magnifier to suit the individual. Now, so this shows the impact of a, ma a magnifier. So these images were taken by a telescope we designed to use in the MRI scanner. Um, and you can see the car park there without the, uh, the telescope and then the enlarged image with the uh, telescope. So it, it just increases the image size, um, but you see less of it at the same time. And the magnification is worked out by the power of the focal length divided by four. Um, and the four is that relates to the plus four um, that I mentioned before. Um, the, and, and that's the base that is always used. Now, some magnifiers are, some uh, manufacturers will already have that plus four built into the power of their magnifier. So then their magnifiers can just be used with distance correction, but others are assuming that you're using their magnifier with reading. So they, they say they've got a higher magnifier, but their actual power of their magnifier lens is lower because they're assuming that you've got the plus four from the reading glasses. So this is something to watch out for. So sometimes you have to, oops, sometimes you have to not go off what they say is the magnification, but look at the actual power that they are reporting. Um, and that's why it's important to try with the reading glasses as well as without. Um, and then this is from uh, this diagram here. Um, down at the bottom is from some work we did where we were looking at reading speed um, and reading size. And your reading speed increases as the size increases until you get to this optimal point. And then it starts decreasing because the words get too big and they take up too much space. So that's why actually 
you need to balance what you're aiming for and you need to balance um spot like you you also need to balance the purpose of what you're trying to read so spot reading is very different to sustained reading so if you just want to look at your post you can push someone's limit um and you can aim for a smaller print size but it doesn't matter if they can't sustain that print size for longer because they just need to get through the post if they want to sit down and read the paper from cover to cover, then that's sustained reading. So for that, you need to aim for a print size that is actually much higher than um, the size of the print that you're actually reading. Otherwise, they're not going to maintain that comfort. Then there are options for distance magnification. So you can have telescopes, monoculars. Um, these are Keeler uh, style um, aids. Uh, so they're glasses and then you can plug in the different um, uh, ads into there. And then these are clip-ons, which I've actually prescribed for non-low vision patients before as well, uh, if someone needs high magnification in their job. These are TV glasses where you can, it's, so it's, it's a type of telescope, but you can adjust each side separately and then clip on monoculars as well. So all of these things are available. Um, now, there are some pitfalls. As you increase the magnification, you decrease the field of view, as I showed you with my photographs. And you also decrease the working distance. So. A lot of people will come in and complain that the magnifiers don't work, but actually it's not that they're not working, it's that they're not using it correctly. So you need to train people and, and set realistic expectations. So as you increase the magnification, they are going to see less in one go and they need to learn to move it along to keep reading. And that's just the way magnification works. Also, as you increase the strength, you need to train them to get closer to the page and you're gonna get a larger field of view if the whole thing comes towards them. So if they can train to bring the whole thing up to their dominant eye and read as close as possible to their dominant eye, they'll have much higher degree of success. Um, I've already spoken about spot reading versus sustained reading, and there are other aids that you can use to help. So this picture here is of a typoscope. So it's basically a space cut out in black card. And what you're doing there is um, highlighting the region of the page that you're interested in, cutting out the, the rest of it so that you can hone in on what this, the area is. Uh, and, and that way it reduces how much extra information you've got and makes it easier to follow the page and follow the line. And using that in addition to the magnifier or using some kind of a line guide, maybe even a ruler or just a page, a line guide can help. If someone's got central vision loss, um, you can use eccentric viewing techniques. So teach them how to use a peripheral locus so that they're looking with their peripheral vision rather than straight on. That takes a lot of training. Um, modern technology has revolutionized low vision. So a lot of modern technology has accessibility features built in. So iPads, computers, smartphones, all have accessibility settings that can um, be switched on as standard. So this will allow uh, screens to be made bigger. It will allow voice um, commands um, and all sorts of things. So a lot of patients actually love to use iPads, even people who are not traditionally very good with technology. Um, and there are YouTube channels dedicated to uh, to, techno uh, to teaching people how to use technology. So there are uh, 
YouTube channels dedicated to teaching people about technology. And the, you can direct people to look those up and they will talk them through about how to switch on the different features, how to use them, what are the shortcuts, but those are absolutely fantastic. So um, I highly recommend using those and iPads are, especially the ones with the matte screen um, are fantastic for reading. Um, but when those aren't enough, you can get special software packages. So things like JAWS um, and Read and Write uh, are screen readers, which will read everything out that's on the screen for you and can be configured for people with visual impairment um, and are just fantastic. There are these newer electronic devices. So these are all different types of smart glasses. Um, that are now available on the market, they all work in completely different ways. So some are using augmented reality, so enhancing the vision. Some are, this one is relaying information back to you. Um, so they all work in completely different ways, but uh, obviously these are, are very pricey. Then these are electronic magnifiers. So this one is a mouse that plugs into the TV and makes your TV into a magnifier. This is a handheld device, um, and this is a standalone device, and this one is a VR um, device that, oh, oh, sorry, a VR headset, which you can attach your phone to, to make your phone into a magnifier. But increasingly, there's a lot you can do with the smartphone. So there are loads and loads and loads and loads of apps. Some are not designed for VI, so Audible is an audio book, library um which is fantastic because then you've got hundreds of books newspapers at your fingertips which you can listen to um and then there are many that are designed for people with visual impairment so be my eyes is an app that i'm registered as a volunteer on both in english and punjabi um where you can uh, anyone who's visually impaired can ask for help. So they can call a volunteer and say, can you help describe this to me? I don't know what I'm looking at. Seeing AI does a similar thing, but using AI technology rather than human volunteers. And then there are lots of very snazzy magnifying lenses because you can use the magnifier on your camera, um, but this can be enhanced using a, an app. So at the end of the consultation, we document which LVAs we've given them. We document the leaflets that we've given them. So we tell patients about other services. Um, and, you know, we, we've got so many in leaflets to give them. We, we can tell them about sports teams. We can tell them about um, charities and clubs. We've got um, holiday companies that specialize in trips for people with visual impairment. Uh, there are gardening clubs and um, we there, there are for anyone who struggles with needles there are you can buy self threading needles um, you can buy um, large print playing cards and board games for children um, there, there's there's quite a lot out there which we can relay back to people and advise them where they can get more information about of this. We can refer them to charities and other services. We can refer them for mobility training. We can explain to family members, ask them about the worries so we make sure we've addressed that. We try and be as reassuring as possible, but be realistic. And then we always see them at least once more to make sure that they're using their low vision aids correctly. And it's always impossible to go through everything the first time because it, people get overwhelmed with the amount of information. So it's always a good idea to set then see them at least once more just to make sure that you've covered everything. So that's the low vision consultation. Um, now this is a interactive part of the talk. So something I wanted to bring your attention to, because obviously I'm a retinal genetics person, is um, we often see, so some conditions are common, are common, 
What do you think this is? What do you think these photos show? Okay, so what if I told you that, um, yes, ARMD could be a possibility, but this, uh, the, so this image on the left is from someone who is 55. Would that change what you're thinking? So this image is wet AMD. This image is Kaderin 1. It's a genetic macular dystrophy. Mis originally misdiagnosed as, as AMD, um, but too young to have AMD. So uh, genotyped and had Kaderin 1, the CDHR1 retinal uh, macular dystrophy so with with our awareness of genetics i think a lot of people with amd and other common conditions are actually being misdiagnosed so anyone who's young should not be being diagnosed with amd and particularly it like with recessive conditions are going to be more likely if there is a history of consanguinity in the family. So that's something to really bear in mind when you're seeing your patients. They're too young to have AMD, but when we did the genetics, they had Kaderin 1, so they had the CDHR1 uh, genetic mutation. And that has implications because then the anti-VEGF injections aren't going to be so effective in this patient. Anyone below 60 absolutely should not be considered AMD. 60 to 70, you should, it can be in the mix, but you should also think about other things. Um, but with the rise, uh, but, but then also think carefully about family history because all the, all the genetic markers for AMD have been risk modifiers related to environment. They are not, um, they are not confirmed uh they're not simple like you have this gene you will get amd they are risk modifiers whereas something like this kadirin one is is a dis uh, disease causing gene um and it's important to differentiate those because the prognosis and the treatment are different for those yeah, so it's important to, to recognize and delve into family history um, and also look carefully at imaging. So if something doesn't look, it does look unusual and has unusual features and if age doesn't quite match up, then do think twice about it um, and do more testing. Um, and you can actually find out about clinical studies that are going on using this website. So clinicaltrials.gov lists, lists all the clinical trials going on around the world. So you can see what's going on and what you can um, refer to or, or even link up with. So who you can get in touch with to see if you can link up with. If you want to do clinical studies of your own, then you know, you find someone who you can link up with that you can work together with um, and develop experience with. So this is this is specifically for clinical trials rather than studies. So a trial is something that has an intervention. A study does not necessarily have an intervention. It's observational. So that's the difference between the two. Um, but uh, so this will list trials. Some studies will be on here, but trials have to be registered. 
So the other thing to bear in mind when you're seeing low vision patient is really be careful about how you phrase things, especially in the early days around diagnosis. You need to give people hope. So don't give them negative phrases. So, so, so don't say things like, I'm sorry to tell you that, or unfortunately you have, um, because then that gives them a negative perception of their disease. So you want to be able to, you know, give them more proactive language that you have, but we can support you by doing this, that, and the other. So try and give it more, more of a proactive um, line. Um, give information and connections. Um, and remember that vision loss does not in erase that individual's talent and their personality. They are still them just because they're visually impaired. Um, what can you do in your clinics? Don't call someone from the waiting room and then walk away. They can't see where you've gone. They can't follow you. So you need to wait and then lead them to your consulting room. Train staff on how to guide people. And there are some excellent videos on YouTube. Um, and Monica, I, I can potentially um, send you some of these links, which you can send out to your mailing list, if you like, um, uh, which like train you on how to actually guide people um, around. Make your websites and social media accessible um, for screen readers, for people with low vision. Consider contrast in your consulting room and buildings. Can Are the different features visible? Are people going to bump into things? Are your communications accessible? Do you have alt text on your social media? Do you have on your images on your website? Um, is Are things in large print? Are, is everything con, uh, high contrast? Um, and I, my last slide, I'm going to leave you with some book recommendations. So these are two um, essential reading books. Um, so one is uh, Low Vision Principles and Practice, and another one listen, um, written by a friend and colleague, Jane McNaughton, Low Vision Assessment. The first step towards achieving your dreams is having the right coach. Get the best education with Learn Beyond Vision and make your optometry dreams come true. Download the app now. Oh,